Thank you, Stephen. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Yes. Good. Right. Let's get going. So I'm going to start before the Kara era, BCE. Good, I'm glad you got that. A bandmaster in the Prussian army flees at the outset of the Franco-Prussian War in 1757, becomes a refugee in London, moves to Richmond in North Yorkshire, not Richmond, London, and then Bath. In 1772, his barely educated sister joins him. Do you know who that was? William and Caroline Herschel, two of the most famous astronomers of all time. William became a fellow of the Royal Society, first president of the Royal Astronomical Society, court astronomer to George III. Caroline, remember she was barely educated when she arrived, was the first woman to hold a salaried position as a scientist, the first to publish in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, and the first and the only one for about 100 years to win the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. So the refugee problem has been with us for all time. It's not just individuals, but it's their families as well. And Britain has welcomed and rewarded refugees, and long may it continue to do so. Uh, when you get invited to do something these days, you're asked to declare your conflicts of interest. So here are mine. Uh, my dad arrived in Cambridge as a research student in 1936. He came from Vienna. Um, he was interned as an enemy alien in 1940. And my mother uh, came a bit earlier, uh, a bit later than Max, a bit earlier than the war in 1938. And she became an assistant to Tess Simpson in the SPSL, Cara's predecessor. Uh, and one of the important roles of the SPSL was to campaign for the release of internees, including Max. Max sought some money from the SPSL but to support him, but in the end he got support from the Rockefeller Foundation. But the important conflict of interest is that my parents met in the offices of the SPSL in 1942, so without um, SPSL, there would be no me. <laughs> uh, so let's just go back. We've heard a little bit about this already from the, to the beginning, the Academic Assistance Council in 1933. Um, on the 30th of January, 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. In March, he got powers to rule by decree. And in April, the law for the restoration of the professional civil service forbidding Jews, non-Aryans, and political opponents from holding positions as teachers and professors was declared. And that was the moment, uh, particularly, when people were dismissed. Now. Lord Beveridge, only he wasn't a lord then, uh, he was uh, principal of LSE, uh, uh, and Robbins, of later of the Robbins Report, uh, uh, are said to have been having tea in a nice uh, cafe in Vienna in March, uh, and learned of the dismissal of Jewish professors. The team may have been with Leo Szilard. If you watched um, the Oppenheimer film, you will have seen something about him. And uh, in May, the, we've heard the AAC, the Academic Assistance Council, was launched. These guys did not waste time. They certainly got on with it. Um, so that the founders were Belt Beveridge, Rutherford, you've heard about, A.V. Hill, the physiologist, Gowland Hopkins, the person who discovered the first vitamins, all Nobel laureates. They, uh, together with 37 of the great and the good from economics, science, humanities, and so on, declared 
the launch of the Academic Assistance Council. And there's the quotation of the 11th of May, the Royal Society Council today agreed the society should do all that you wish in connection with the appeal, signed Rutherford. You can go and find his portrait somewhere in the Royal Society. Um, so um, the story goes that a man called Walter Adams from University College London got going on the nuts and bolts and he wanted to enlist Einstein and he chased Einstein down to the Norfolk coast where he was hiding away for some reason and said, would you do the launch? And the answer was yes. Uh, uh, Adams is said to have rushed to book the Albert Hall and uh, Einstein did the launch in October 33. Uh, with, and Einstein laid it on thick, if you look at his speech. Without such freedom, there would have been no Shakespeare, no Goethe, no Newton, no Faraday, no Pasteur, and no Lister. And so it went on. Um, yes, he really laid it on thick. Um, right. Um, so a crucial appointment came. Um, the... Uh, people who founded it needed somebody to do the hard work. There's plenty of room up the front, by the way. Please feel free to come to the front. And um, they found this woman called Tess Simpson and asked her to be the assistant secretary, in other words, to do the hard work. And uh, she continued doing so until 1978, a remarkably long time. And there are lots and lots of stories about her, her empathy, the way she responded to people, the commitment to the individuals and their families, and clearly tireless work, but also flexibility in dealing with the complications that, that different people present. Uh, so that was critical. Uh, I put this up in case you get really confused. Um, we've already had a bit of uh, clarification of this problem. The, uh, starting at the start, it was called the Academic Assistance Council. In 36, it changed to the Society for the Protection of Science and Learning, SPSL in 99 to the Council for Assisting Refugee Academics. Unfortunately, in 2014, the um, acronym remained CARA, Council for At-Risk Academics. So that's just in case you're getting confused. Well, early achievements, we've heard a, bit, a little bit about the numbers. Already by the 1938, 550 refugee scholars had been permanently placed in 38 different countries. It wasn't just the UK organizations and 330 more temporarily placed in 25 countries. And the scholars came from Germany, Austria, Italy, Spain. Um, so those numbers underneath are those who were registered now, clearly, they had to do pretty stringent selection because there were far more people who needed help than could be accommodated. And then in 1940, during the war, with the internment issue, it became their task to try and get these people out of internment, these people who uh, detested Hitler's regime, but were interned. And 550 applications with individual details were prepared for their release. The poster, by the way, uh, comes from an artist, Hugo Dachinger, and he was interned in the Isle of Man. And uh, the exhibition was of his artwork from internment. Uh, so, impact. Impact is what everybody wants to know about these days. Um, um, here's impact. Nicholas Pevsner, The Buildings of England. There was no compendium of all the wonderful buildings in this country until Nicholas Pevsner, who was supported by CARA, uh, uh, 
produced all these volumes that many of you may be familiar with, uh, county by county, uh, uh, for the buildings of England. Uh, Stoke Mandeville is famous for its rehabilitation work. The person who started that was Ludwig Gutmann, uh, and he is also credited with starting the, what was first called the Stoke Mandeville Games, but then moved to become the Paralympics. So his nickname is the Angel of the Paralympics. Now, it's true that the vast majority of these people were male, uh, but not all. Edith Budbring was a physiologist uh, working uh, uh, in Oxford, and she became very well known in her own right. Uh, two more. Penicillin. Penicillin, the standard name is Fleming. Fleming discovers a mold. It was dirty, mucky stuff and with a purity of, I can't remember what, 0.001% or worse. Uh, the people who turned it into something that we can use were Flory and Ernst Chain. There's the uh, blue plaque from Oxford. The story of art, the book that presented art for everybody in a really comprehensive way, that's the work of Ernst Gombrich. Uh, so Max, my father, summarized this as Hitler's gift to Britain was talent more valuable than gold. And of course, Kara's predecessors enabled the country to benefit from that talent. Uh, the list of Nobel laureates, including Max, and uh, fellows of the Royal Society and the fellows of the British Academy goes on and on. It's remarkable how many of these came as displaced people, how many of them uh, uh, was supported by Cara. Uh, so Max said a little bit more, and I think it's worth going over that. Had I stayed in my native Austria, even if there had been no Hitler, I could never have solved the problem of protein structure or founded the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. I would not have had the outstanding teachers and colleagues or learnt scientific rigor. I have, would have lacked the the stimulus, the role models, we all owe a tremendous debt to Britain. So that's the forward from a book called Hitler's Gift. Uh, so it may be stretching a point, uh, but would the Laboratory of Molecular Biology ever have existed without the original support of CARA uh, for Max uh, and without Max having met my mother, Giesler? Um, I doubt it. <laughs> and the Laboratory of the Molecular Biology is the nickname, other name, is the Nobel Prize factory. So moving on, post-war, the geography of the problems shifted, and uh, shifted principally to South America and Africa. There are plenty of seats up the front. Um, and uh, in South America, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, in Africa, a whole range of different countries. I'll just pick out one person, Jack Mapanji, a Malawian poet, uh, and he wrote, like many other refugees and exiles, we did not feel alone and dejected in a foreign land we felt that we belonged to a world that cared for our lives and the lives of our families. So um, Jack Mpanji was actually uh, a CARA fellow uh, in the University of York in the 1980s, uh, supported by uh, the Center for South African, Southern African Studies by uh, Landeg White. So uh, that, I come from the University of York, by the way. Uh, so, 
Does it matter? Can we make a difference? Well, is it a, just a drop in the ocean or are we doing something? According to UNHCR, there are currently 35 million refugees displaced to foreign countries. Total number of displaced people is three times that. How many of those qual might qualify for CARA's help? We don't know the answer to that number. Uh, nobody has found an answer. So does it really make a difference? By the way, this is a, another picture from a refugee. Um, well, uh, my view is perfectly clear. Most of us can only help individuals, but helping those individuals makes a massive difference, not just to them, it makes a difference to us, the people who do the helping. We benefit it. So um, I've just mentioned Landig White, who helped with the University of York, who helped um, Jack Mapanji. I haven't managed to identify anybody else until I hosted myself uh, in 2014 and to 2016. And the person I hosted, Husni Nakashbandi, is here together in the picture. He isn't actually in the room, unfortunately. He couldn't get off work. Uh, he's um, here with his wife and two children. The two children by now are bigger and um, particularly one of them, and um, they are both at university. A great success story. Um, two more CARA fellows from Syria and one from the, uh, supported by the scholars at risk have worked in my department, including Saeed, who may be here. I don't know whether Saeed's actually here. Um, um, and now the university hosts for Ukrainians supported by CARA. I have no doubt whatsoever, if we can support individuals, that makes a huge difference, and CARA enables us to do that. So, happy 90th, CARA. Uh, and I've, just to do the acknowledgements, I've found a lot of material in the books I mentioned down there. Jeremy Seabrooks, Shula Marx, Andrew Bound, Jean Medower, and Esther Saraga. Thank you.